Some years ago, I entered a team of high school students in a model truss bridge building competition. Since then, I've run a number of in-school competitions in various places, each time fine-tuning my own particular slant on things. So, what is a truss bridge? Simply, it's a bridge that is made up of connected pieces of material, mostly in the shape of triangles. So let's look at why triangles are so important in truss bridge construction. Let's begin by examining a quadrilateral, which is a four-sided shape. Notice how a quadrilateral can easily be distorted, that is, bent out of shape. And now, look at a triangle. It doesn't distort. Right, now let's look at a three-dimensional figure made up of quadrilaterals, a cuboid. This is the basic outline that is needed for a bridge. The problem is, as we saw a moment ago, a quadrilateral is liable to distort. And in the case of a three-dimensional figure, it can distort in three different ways, or in fact a combination of them. So the question is how to take a basic bridge shape that will transport vehicles and make it strong. Let's go back for a moment to our plane quadrilateral figure. If we join two opposite corners with a diagonal, we still have the quadrilateral, but it is now divided into two triangles, making it rigid. Now let's take this idea to our three-dimensional shape. If we subdivide the quadrilaterals with diagonals, we get triangles, and the shape is now rigid in every direction. Here are some different types of truss bridges. Notice the triangles. The pieces used to construct a bridge are usually straight and are called members. The members join together at nodes. The members and nodes are under load because of the forces acting on them. In truss bridges, there are two main forces, tension and compression. Materials such as wood and steel are usually stronger in tension than in compression. Here's an example. This bamboo skewer is very strong in tension. No matter how hard I try to break it by pulling it apart, I just, I'm just not able to succeed. But if I exert a pushing force, the bamboo begins to buckle and without too much compression, it breaks. Hmm. To make the members stronger in compression, you can either shorten the distances between the nodes so that there's less tendency to buckle or use more material, and more skewers in this case, or you can do both. In the competitions I run, the load is placed in the center, there. But how do we know which members of a truss bridge are in tension and which are in compression? Let's look at some examples. In each of the diagrams, the members in tension are shown in blue and the members in compression are in red. To keep things really simple, I've shown very approximately the relative forces that are being exerted by how thick I've drawn the members. Notice the similarities between which parts are normally under tension and which are normally under compression. If you would like to get more technical and experiment with different designs in a virtual setting, then go to the Johns Hopkins University Truss Bridge Simulator which can be found at the URL on the screen at the moment. Let's begin with a general description and the rules. Basically, participants must, using a set quantity of materials, build a model bridge that will carry the greatest load suspended from a 10 centimeter section in the middle of a 50 centimeter span from here to here. The roadbed of each bridge must be a minimum of 7 centimeters to 12 centimeters wide. Bridges are tested until they fail. 
A bridge is said to fail when it breaks at one or more members or nodes. Each team is provided with paper on which to make a full-size design of the side view of the bridge. Also, 70 bamboo kebab skewers, 60 pieces of 2 cm by 3 cm thin card for gusset plates, epoxy and or wood glue, the same amount for each team, sandpaper, which you need to use to sand the members so that the glue sticks really well, binder clips, large paper clips, and tack it to hold material in place for gluing. Team members should supply their own pencils, erasers, sharpeners, rulers, and scissors. Let's have a look at the template. It's made up of two A4 pieces of paper joined end to end. You can see the center line marked on both the left and right pieces of paper. Cut along the center line on one of the pieces of paper and glue the two pieces together along that line to create one template. The template is 54 centimeters long and is divided horizontally into six sections of nine centimeters each and two sections vertically. This grid is merely there to offer a starting point on which to line up your measurements. You do not have to use any of the lines or intersections in your design. Also, if you want to make your bridge higher than the paper allows, you may glue more paper on to increase the height of your template. The next step is to design the sides of your bridge on the template, thinking about where you will use the bamboo skewers and card gussets. You don't want to get most of the way through your project only to find that you are running out of materials. So spend time measuring and allocating your materials before you begin assembly. As an example, I'm going to show you how to build a Warren Trust bridge with one extra member, which is the one I've been showing so far. I've drawn my design in red on the template just to make it easier to identify in the video. I begin by sticking down cardboard gussets at all the nodes. I'm doing this with paper glue, but you could also use blue tack or tacket. The gussets should be glued down only enough to stop them moving around because you're going to pull the paper template away from the bridge side once it has been constructed. If it were not for the gussets, bridges would be weak at the nodes where the members join. In real bridges, of course, the gussets are made from steel and rivets are normally used as fasteners. Next, I begin to measure and cut the bamboo pieces, joining them at the nodes. If you don't have a pair of side cutting pliers, nail clippers or toenail clippers work really well for this job. For this particular construction, I'm using epoxy glue for the sides because it sets quickly. I could also use PVA wood glue, which is cheaper, but the pieces need clamping while the glue dries. So I usually use epoxy for the sides, where I find clamping to the plan a little bit fiddly, and then I change to a white PVA glue for the rest of the construction. The epoxy is supposed to set in four minutes, but it's better to leave it for about 10 minutes before you handle the work. I find that using erasers as weights is quite useful for keeping the members in place as the glue sets. To make the nodes extra strong on the bridge sides, I glue gussets on both sides of the members. Now to the second side of the bridge. You can either use the template again, or you can build it on top of the first side. So I'm using Tacket, and then the procedure is the same as for the first side. Now that the second side is complete, the next step is to put the two sides together.
As you can see, the bridge is now rigid longitudinally where it is triangulated, but not in the other two directions. This is where I change to white wood glue, clamping with 50 millimeter paper clips and small binder clips to make the bridge rigid in all directions. Now to the testing. The apparatus that I use to put the bridges under load consists of a block of wood six centimeters wide and three centimeters high. It rests on two pieces of wood which are two centimeters by 1.5 centimeters by 14 centimeters long. A strong piece of cord is threaded through a hole in the middle of the block and a large container for water is slung beneath it. Water is gradually poured into the container until the bridge fails. The weight that the bridge held just before it failed is measured on a bathroom scale and converted to newtons so that the force required to break the bridge can be measured in the appropriate units. In this test, I got to just under 12 kilograms and the top members were buckling under compression even though I doubled up on them in the design. Actually, this is where using bamboo skewers to build a bridge was, I think, quite a good idea because their flexibility enables you to test in advance of the competition and more easily analyze where potential problems lie. And then you can make design adjustments. Well, it didn't work for me because just after this point, the bridge failed, but I didn't get it on video. Anyway, I decided to modify it. But at that point, I had set myself a target of making a bridge with 50 skewers, and I'd used the full quota already. So I removed the members that I'm showing you here, and I used their equivalent length to add nodes and cross members along the top, as you can see. Then I tested the modified bridge. As you can see, the members didn't buckle laterally, that is across. They chose a new direction which was down, where there wasn't any reinforcement. As we look at this again, in freeze frame and in slow motion, think about what you would do if you were building a similar bridge to make the parts of the bridge that are in compression stronger. In my analysis afterwards, I felt that 50 skewers was too few to allow for the best possible design given the 50 centimeter span the bridge had to cover. So I increased the number to 70 for future competitions. After a bridge has been tested, it can usually easily be mended cosmetically in which case students could be encouraged to paint and decorate their bridges as showpieces. Well, I hope that was useful. If you thought so, please click like. Thanks and enjoy your bridge building. Bye.